Yes, absolutely. Quite honored, and and thank you as well for for asking me to uh, to have this privilege to uh, to start our uh, our session in a good way, and to acknowledge that we are uh, all of us in our in own individual places on traditional lands of Indigenous peoples. For myself, I'm in um, you know, the community known as St. John's. And uh, these are in Newfoundland, the traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq and the Beothic. I am uh, from Labrador myself, and those are the traditional lands of the uh, Inuit and the Innu. And so I would just like us to, uh, to always keep that in mind and in the spirit of reconciliation to remember that the lands that we are on do belong to the first peoples of those places and that we always look to honor them in the work we do and how we live our lives and to, to step softly on Mother Earth. And uh, ask for good blessings for our, our talk today. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Charlie Murphy or Charles. Um, I go by he, him, they, them pronouns. I am the CBRC uh, Newfoundland, Labrador, uh, St. John's rep um, for uh, the work that they do. Um, and they are a national uh, organization that uh, looks after uh, queer men, gay men, um, two-spirit, uh, trans uh, men, all of that kind of healthcare. Um, and I'm also a co-founder for Quadrangle, and that is our provincial charity that is currently trying to get a, a community center. Uh, and so this particular presentation uh, and workshop, our webinar story series uh, stemmed from a pivot program, which was a four-day leadership program around uh, healthcare when it comes to LGBTQ2S queer and trans individuals. Um, and from that, our group, uh, of volunteers picked the idea around sexual education being more inclusive. So with that, I'm going to then disappear and introduce uh, Jen, who was one of our volunteers and will lead us through this lovely first session. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, yeah, hey, my name is Jen. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, or they, them. I'm fine with either. Um, so I know Charlie just introduced a little bit about Pivot, but I just wanted to expand on that a little bit because it uh, it has been an awesome opportunity. So we started back in March. Um, we did, like Charlie said, four days of um, like queer sexual health interventions, uh, workshops on health advocacy. We learned about just different like uh, products and, and activisms that we could take out into the community and, and help um, spread the word about queer health. Um, so basically we were asked to design a project and the, the group of us, we had a really great rapport. We were had an excellent time actually. It was really awesome to spend time with everybody because it was at the, the heat of COVID and we were meeting sometimes once a week, every two weeks, um, but it was great to get together, get connected. We were having awesome conversations. And I think part of that is we were having those conversations and said, I wish these could be public. I, I wish that we could be having these with everybody. I wish everybody had access to this information. And one of the things that we had talked about was that we really wanted to tackle the topic of sexual health education because it is not talked about a lot and I find I know myself I have just like a, a personal interest in sexual health education I've carried it through my academic career in my professional career in my volunteering um, <laughs> I told the speakers yesterday about a few years ago I had wrote a paper I was 25 at the time in a course about reproductive justice and I wrote a paper on how I was a 25 year old lesbian and I had just found out what a dental dam was and <laughs> uh, if you don't know what it is it's a barrier method for uh, for folks who have sex with vaginas or who have vaginas and have sex <laughs> and I was out for about a decade and had no idea and I found out and I was like you know, that's something that I probably should have known about. And that's totally fair that I didn't because I think that I, you know, myself, I'm a product of the education that I received and the education that I sought after. But since then, have tried very hard to make sure that I create a space that's inclusive, that's have sex positive. Um, so I think that for me, my interest in this group was to spread the word. And I love that we have the opportunity to invite cool speakers like Denise and like Emmy, who we're gonna introduce now. Um, so Denise is an awesome community activist, has been involved in a lot of Labrador uh, sexual health information and resources. Um, I'm gonna let Denise speak a little bit more about that because I'm sure that she can expand on that better. And Emmy is somebody who just graduated high school um, and 
was the leader of their GSA for a few years and has actually done a lot of presentations on sexual health and queer sexual health. So when you're ready, you want to introduce yourselves, I would love to, uh, love to hear more about you. Denise, if you want to start, you're more than welcome. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And uh, so as Jennifer said, uh, I am from Labrador. I uh, am a uh, two-spirit uh, Inuk land protector. I work currently at the Labrador Friendship Center. I run a project there called SHIELD, which stands for Sexual Health Information Exchange Labrador District. I work uh, specifically with youth ages 12 to 18, but we uh, use activities that are art, culture, and technology based uh, to create safe spaces to talk about sexual health, but also look Looking at overall holistic well-being, so everything's really on our table as well to uh, talk about. Uh, myself, I am, uh, you know, I've uh, I've been walking this path a little while. I'm uh, 45 years old and have been involved in in uh, helping to host the first uh, 2S LGBTQ plus uh, Pride celebrations in Labrador back in 2010. And that's through the Safe Alliance. So I'm one of the co-founders and still longtime members of that collective. And just, yeah, really uh, happy and humbled to be here. And I certainly look at myself as two-spirited, being uh, not just about my gender and my sexuality. It is really a holistic, it's, it's all of me. It's how I, I get to be whole. And uh, so I see it very much as a spiritual part of my life as well. Uh, so I think that's probably enough about me, uh, but I'm pretty much an open book and really open to any types of questions and just want to help and share. Awesome. Emmy, whenever you're ready, take it away. So my name is Emmy. I'm 17. I just graduated high school in Torbay. Um, I did run my school's GSA, which we called SAGA, which stands for Sexuality and Gender Acceptance. I ran it for about two years. And I loved every second of it. I've met so many amazing people. Um, I went to so many different conferences and workshops and I learned so much um, because sometimes the schools aren't great at teaching everybody everything you need to know. So I'm really glad I had the opportunities that I had to go out and learn what I did learn. And I'm really excited to be able to share that information. Awesome. Um, something I actually should have probably tended to uh, was that I should let you all know that I'm sure you've realized now, but that this is a recorded session. So I want to let you know that unless you turn on your camera or your audio, you are anonymous. Um, but do know that this is recorded and it will become publicly available. So if you do ask a question in the chat, uh, just know that your name or your initials or whatever will show up. Um, we encourage you to check Zoom's privacy policy, which is at zoom.us slash policy, I think, or privacy, sorry. Um, and uh, if you do have any questions, you can contact Charlie or the regional or Kirk, who's from CBRC. And um, we can get you the email if you have any questions about privacy. Um, I also, I know I mentioned a little bit about the project, but I wanted to maybe a little bit explain the mission mandate of this series, so Sex at the Kitchen Table. So basically, we wanted to create a space that was inclusive sexual health. But one of the one of the the thing, the most important things about this was that we wanted it to be casual and uh, just like a very relaxed chat and a space that was accessible and that folks could contribute and that we could have like diverse panelists that could come in and speak about many different kinds of experiences, some with professional backgrounds, some with personal experiences. And throughout this entire series, which is gonna be eight webinars, we're gonna have many different people who can speak to uh, sexual liberation, so like sex and porn and media or folks who wanna talk about kink or BDSM or safer sex practices like, PrEP and PEP and barrier methods, and we'll have a host of awesome speakers, but the point of this is to be casual and fun and um, just engage as you want to. So um, I should also mention that Elliot was uh, somebody who is supposed to be joining us here today. Elliot is the executive director of Planned Parenthood in Ottawa, um, but is not here right now. So we're just gonna keep moving on with the questions. And if Elliot does join us, then we're gonna hear from him as well. Um, a little bit of context, Elliot was also the executive director of Planned Parenthood here in Newfoundland, Labrador, and he's also was part of the Pivot Project before he moved to Ottawa. So it's a little bit about uh, Elliot. And one last thing before we go into the questions, we know we do not have ASL right now. We have been trying to get someone, um, and they will be for the continuation of, of the webinar series, but with the tight deadline, um, and everyone really in that need of making sure all of their events that are happening being hosted online, 
Um, we just couldn't get someone at this time, but we will be pushing for it for the next seven. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, okay, well, honestly, I'm gonna take down this, stop, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen now so we can just hang out and chat. Um, yeah, so I know you guys both told me a little bit about how you've been involved in sexual health and that sort of thing. Like I know, Amy, you said you ran your GSA um, and you've, I know you told me you've done presentations on that and Denise, you've, you've also done immense, uh, tremendous work in sexual health. I'm just wondering why, why are both of you why were you passionate about sexual health? Like, why is this something that you even got yourself involved in? Is it, was it because you feel there's a lack of it or is it just because you ended up there? Like, why, why did you, why did you choose to get in sexual health services or have an interest in it? Either or, you can just hop in whenever you're ready. Um, well, for me, when I grew up fairly sheltered, so I didn't have a lot of access to information so when I realized that I was gay, I didn't even know what it meant. I was confused and I didn't know anything about gay sexual health at all because that was just completely off the table. So I really wanted to be able to not leave other people where I was kind of confused and wondering and curious. So reaching out to different teachers in my school, I was able to do some presentations and seeing, I had emails, to, <laughs> people were <laughs> me after saying that I was the first person that had talked to them about this, the first person that had mentioned all these identities that they had never heard of. And every email I got made me want to do it more and more. So here I am. That's awesome. What about you, Denise? I, I think for me, uh, like I was, uh, which for me, it's, a, it's well, it, it speaks to where we're at. Uh, we look at the big, like the, there's a big age difference between myself and Emmy, and that Emmy, same thing as I, my experience was when I realized, you know, things around where my sexual preferences were. Uh, we weren't even talking really about gender identities much at that point in time. But I graduated in 1993. But that you still had to dig to find the information. Uh, I went to the school system was still. Uh, religion-based. So I went to a Pentecostal school until grade 11. Uh, so that led to tremendous amounts of uh, confusion for me, shame, uh, guilt, that level of trauma that we didn't even talk about sex in the classroom, let alone sex education. So it was a lot of learning things the really hard way. And uh, then when I, you know, got out of school and into my adult years uh, and then tried to understand what was going on with me, I, you know, just, yeah, it was a long time figuring it out. And then when I came to learn about being two-spirited, I was in my 30s, you know, so it's, uh, it's been a long evolving process. And my passion comes from meeting so many people like myself or through other experiences they've had and then working with young people where I hear it over and over and over again that they don't have the safe spaces they need that I'm the first person who's ever asked them their pronouns or that has made it okay for them to be themselves like there's a I have a there's something really wrong with that like I, I don't do the big pat on my back I'm so wonderful it's like what is happening that that this is not just the way it should be so that made me really, really passionate then um, about what we're doing. And I have to say the funder for SHIELD through the Public Health Agency of Canada, they're tremendous and their level of support about making safe and inclusive spaces and allowing me to have a lot of freedom to say, here's my experience. My experience does not define everybody in the queer community. We all have our own stories to tell and we need to create the space to make it okay for us to talk about anything and everything. Uh, because the same thing like you, Jennifer, like dental dams, even now dental dams, when we get them for our anything, do not come with instructions, you know? So I've created my own so I can give them out when we give out dental dams. But that's, that's a reality of how little the education is around and that's just safer sex that's not getting into the whole beautiful spectrum of everything else that we can you know experience and feel really good about it instead of being scared about so yeah that's what made me passionate was that we need to know and we have every right to know and it's our responsibility to do it totally 
actually, uh, about a week ago, I saw that Erica Lust had actually posted, I'm not sure if you're aware of Erica Lust, but they're, uh, again, like ethical and feminist porn creator, but they had posted a video about, um, like, lesbian sex ed, essentially, and it was, it was a video about how to teach you how to use a dental dam, and I was like, well, geez, I might as well watch it, <laughs> like, I have to know, uh, and it was very informative, it was like, I, I, again, it doesn't come with instructions, and I, watch it I was like okay that's the instructions it's good to know um so it's fascinating actually um I'm just wondering like I know that you 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 operate you in sexual health services but outside of the school system how how do you find do you find they rub up against each other are they complementary like how do you find your Denise in particular how do you find your experience working outside of the school system um if you don't mind sharing not at all. It's a great question. I actually find communities are much more open, uh, unfortunately, than schools. I mean, it's really good. Communities are very open. Uh, I think schools do have some work to do. Uh, with that said, I mean, I didn't get to learn anything. Now, at least I can go into schools and put up posters. Um, sex ed is taught as a class after a certain grade. Um, I think we really need to kind of open up our minds and that comes to decision makers. So I think schools, as well as all community groups, whatever ways we can do this, uh, my indigenous organization, I mean, it's been a, a great learning curve and they've been really open to, to, to the learning, which is really good. Uh, but I think there's still a lot of fear in schools about how parents are gonna respond to their young person coming home with this information. And uh, then there's other things that, that seem like kind of strange technicalities around, you know, if a condom gets filled up with water and thrown in a hallway, like that's when you compare that to the amount of worth of having young people, exp you know, be able to take out a condom, get comfortable with it, you know, to laugh a little bit about it. So it's sex positive. Like it's, yep. so I think we still have some work to do, but I know when I'm out into community, it's been amazing because I have, you know, I've had elders, you know, indigenous elders say it to me, I want to know more about sexual health. I have grandkids. I want to be able to talk to them. They're coming with these different words and terms that I have no idea what they're talking about help. And so I've been invited in to do gender and uh, sexual sexuality diversity with, with elder at elder luncheons at indigenous governments. And so that's to me is really encouraging or to have a parent or a caregiver. I do work with group homes, you know, like it's, the communities are hungry for it. Um, so I think schools need to kind of catch up. Uh, and, and I say that respectfully because they have come a long way, but they still have some work to do and to not, you know, be afraid of it. <laughs> and, uh, and to also make sure their teachers or whoever is teaching sex ed has the information and also has the permission to bring people in from the community who are uh, doing this type of work like myself. I mean, it's good that they invite in, um, you know, individuals. A lot of times it's people from mental health or addictions, which is great. But there's some of us that this has become our expertise. And uh, so it shouldn't just be uh, on stand up to bullying day. It shouldn't just be when we're acknowledging pride month. Like it needs to be all year round. So that's, yeah, I could go on and on about <laughs> some of the different, <laughs> but we are, I mean, we are evolving. Uh, we just, let's do it faster. <laughs> no, totally. And I mean, you just, I mean, we touched on a little bit, but you just came out of the school system. So like, how was, I mean, how was your experience in health class? Was it different from what you learned in your GSA or was it, did you find your GSA had, you know, was it more open, more, obviously it would have been more inclusive, I'm sure, but like, how was your experience actually in the class? What did you, how did you find it? So in my school system, like how I went through, we had one presentation in fifth grade, I think, that was focused on puberty. And then it was nothing until ninth grade when we had a mandatory health class that took up only a third of the year. So our health, everything I've learned in school has been taught in that third of the year in grade nine. And we talked, when we focused on things like consent, the teacher would put on a video. I'm sure many people have heard of the T video. That was my only introduction <laughs> to consent was the T video. Um, and when it came to sexuality, the teacher was a little bit open about it. like. Mm -hmm. You know, she would still say girls and boys, but sometimes she'd fix herself and kind of try to be more inclusive. But when it came to gender, it was it was terrible. 
um, the story I remember the most. Um, are, so the health curriculum, instead of having LGBTQ things in every unit, they had a unit dedicated to LGBTQ as though we're separate from everyone else. So yeah. when it came to the day we were supposed to learn about gender, the teacher put up a visual on the board that said the gender spectrum and everyone in my class started yelling, there's only two genders. And they yelled it so much, the teacher took down the presentation and we moved on to the next one. And that's all we touched on it. Wow. And that was how many years ago? Four years ago. Wow. And I, I mean, I know that teachers are operating with a specific curriculum that they have to, um, that they have to facilitate, say, for the students. But I do know that part of that curriculum is that they can choose to adapt it and choose to elaborate on certain parts or choose to, you know, um, just share more information than not, I guess. Um, so it's super unfortunate that, you know, that that is the experience that you had with that. I'm, um, I'm just wondering, like, particularly for the both of you outside of school and outside of your jobs, like what kind of resources did you access? Like, how did you find the information if you weren't receiving it in schools or elsewhere? Where, where do you look for that kind of information? Go either or. <laughs> I, I know f uh, for myself, like, especially, you know, being young, uh, like when I was younger, <laughs> and realize like okay uh all of these heteronormative you know things that before there was the word heteronormative <laughs> that uh that i'm told so this is where i'm supposed to fit you know i grew up with the whole uh being called a tomboy or aren't why aren't you more like a girl why aren't you this like the, all of those things uh, the whole idea of sex was completely foreign and awkward and uncomfortable and uh, I remember my mom leaving some pamphlets on my bed that were more about when I started my period than anything else um, you know as I got older and started hearing different words like you know having that struggle that internal struggle of like I don't seem to fit anywhere here and uh, so in, in, for me it was like either you were gay or you were straight or you were bi and if you were bi which to me is was one of the hardest things was that somehow that made you cowardly somehow that made you like you couldn't make up your mind you know like you needed to to hide away somewhere and, and that that's so problematic um and i think of like the spectrum of where it is now i've had to go learn most of it myself and uh once the internet became something that was actually navigable <laughs> and google existed uh like i think of katie uh c-a-t-i-e dot c-a has amazing resources i've actually sent boxes of those resources to schools all up and down the coast of labrador and uh, so I, I tend to do a lot of things and try to make sure we're getting the correct information and credible information right and, and try to break down some of the stigmas uh the two-spirit part for me i remember having uh, i'm part of the wabanaki two-spirit alliance i'm on their advisory council now but they had reached out to me uh duma Duma Young had reached out and said, we're hearing about things you're doing in Labrador. This was quite a few years ago and said, we, we want you to come to this two-spirit gathering. And I said, like, I, I'm, I'm Inuit. Um, you know, I always heard of two-spirit. I, I had to be First Nations. And uh, it was him who, who taught me a lot about loving and accepting myself as I am. And I went to that gathering and it just opened up this whole world for me that was much beyond my, my, my gender and my sexuality it was also it became very spiritual and I, I remember going through a grieving process because colonization you know of what that had done to us as indigenous queer people or just as indigenous two-spirit people uh, and not to go too much off into a sidetrack here but it's really been then learning teachings and finding other um you know, indigenous two spirits and guides who are able to do those types of teachings and help with the healing work because there is a lot of trauma that comes up along. Like I think of something like, you know, Emmy, what you experienced in that classroom where somebody pulls down a gender spectrum, like the person who needed to feel safe in that space. I, you know, I know what it's like to be in those spaces and to be terrified. 
And that's traumatic. And that's stuff that we have to grieve and heal from as we get older. And it leads to a lot of problems around mental health, around addictions, around uh, how we beat ourselves up, you know. Uh, so I think the education then becomes not just about understanding sexual health and sexual education. It's also about how to feel safe in your own skin and to love yourself. So that that's why I say holistic in this overall well-being, because that is so much more than just a sex of it uh the sex gets to be the beautiful bonus of it <laughs> you know yeah definitely. absolutely um i do notice somebody in the chat had asked what um uh, what site i had mentioned for the dental dam tutorial uh so the it's erica lust erica with a k um i know that i found it on instagram if you're looking or if you're on instagram but i know that she also has a website she does um uh there's uh, like courses not courses um tutorials, uh, but she has a great like online uh, video space. Um, Emmy, I was going to ask you the same question. So, you know, you're, you're not working directly in community because you're just graduating high school. So I'm just wondering, like, as a young person, what, where do you find your resources? Like, I don't use TikTok, but do you, you know, do you find them on TikTok? I don't know. Like, where do you, well, like, how do you find them? I can say I've definitely found some informational stuff on TikTok, okay. <laughs> but definitely mainly the internet for sure. Because yeah. that's what I had access to from pretty young age. Is there and, any sites in particular? or? Um, I feel like the most that I learned about myself was those little, like, am I gay quizzes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody um, loves a quiz. <laughs> I don't know if I remember any specific sites, but I definitely would just, like, Google the questions I had and kind of go through, try to find, uh, like, certified websites or bigger definitely. websites. But I did a lot of that. Charlie, I, can, I know you're back now. So I'm just wondering, I, want, I was wondering if you want to explain why, quadri why Quadrangle even wanted to be involved in a project like this. Like, why did you partner with Pivot and with CBRC um, and t tackle on sexual health a little bit if you want to talk about it? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, so two of my main, um, over the last 11, 12 years, focuses around activism have been around sexual health and uh, queer and trans identity. Uh, so a lot of those things overlap. Like when we look at sexual liberation, a lot of that is, it is encompassed of our whole historical journey. Um, and so I was very fortunate to be pulled into an organization like CBRC who does a lot of amazing uh, sexual health research and projects and discussions. Um, and so from that with just being with Quad and, and, and trying to create a community hub, it was just an easy kind of fit and layover where two of my passions were kind of uh, overlapping and linking. And because the volunteers of the program, of the Pivot program, that four day leadership were so interested in inclusive sexual health, it was just really nice to sit back and let something kind of take shape that also had my interest. Um, but yeah, like that was the, my main reasonings was just like it just seemed like a good partnership and also the individuals involved kind of saw that overlap and that that need mm -hmm. and do you think that like when quadrangle eventually has a community center do you think that sexual health services might be a part of it or do you think that that's a focus of the organization in any way like how how does that um, relate to quadrangle i don't know like that's like one of those bigger questions i mean i feel <laughs> like again like i think things overlap so much that that is a possibility i believe there's lots of ways to partner with organizations that are currently doing that work as well. I mean, there's lots in St. John's, there's lots in Labrador. Um, mm -hmm. I've worked with Denise um, on a number of things, uh, even outside of Pivot. So I'm, I would love for Quadrangle to work with a lot more Labrador um, supports and resources and, you know, bridge, bridge those, those gaps of like, what is, what is missing um, and how can we share resources? Because that is the point of Quadrangle is sharing resources, connecting the province and making everyone feel and be more included. Yeah. Hi, Elliot. Hi, Elliot. Hello. <laughs> Sorry about being a little late here. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Did you want to introduce yourself for everybody? Because I know we're a little bit into the chat now, but if you want to tell everybody a bit about your work and who you are and what you do. Sure, right. absolutely. Um, 
So my name is Elliot Chapel. My pronouns are he and him. I am currently the executive director of Planned Parenthood Ottawa, and I'm coming to you from lovely Ottawa, which uh, is the time zone goes in a different direction. So that's uh, that's a little bit who I am and why I'm a bit late. So uh, it's really nice to be here and uh, join the chat. Totally fair. I've been to, I know that myself, I'm, I work at YWCA St. John's and I know that I've had a few meetings lately where I went to go jump on a Zoom call and I'm like, wow, I'm two and a half hours early. I'm going to fill my time with something else now. So totally can appreciate the time difference. Uh, it's, it's definitely an interesting time to be joining Zoom calls. So um, yeah, but basically we've been talking a lot about um, just our sexual health education experiences. So I know that Janice spoke a lot about being a sexual health service provider, uh, especially in Labrador and how that interacts with the school system. I'm wondering if you, Elliot in particular, if you want to speak a little bit about how Planned Parenthood interacts with sexual health in the school system or yeah. how you found your experience. Absolutely. So uh, I was previously executive director with uh, Planned Parenthood Newfoundland and worked with the school system there. And I've uh, been working uh, here in Planned Parenthood Ottawa uh, and since I just joined, we've had sort of a pandemic, so it's a bit of a different situation, but uh, our relationship with the schools is very much the same. There's quite a need for comprehensive and inclusive sex ed, which the schools are either uh, unwilling or uh, not comfortable providing, and so they often outsource that to Planned Parenthood. When I was with Planned Parenthood in Newfoundland, we uh, actually wound up going out in person to deliver a presentation on non-binary identities, uh, sort of a beyond the gender binary, and that had been at the request of a... Uh, a guidance counselor because uh, again even if service providers the schools don't feel like they are comfortable talking about LGBT people what is happening is of course we have LGBT people in the schools and in this case it was a student who identified that way the other students weren't sort of understanding of it and so we came in and we did a presentation but it would be far nicer to be able to do that presentation without uh, uh, needing it to be sparked by a student requesting it. It should just be something available so that students already are in welcoming and safe environments where they get to have their identities addressed in that way. Um, here in Ottawa, we are focusing more on consent. That is, seems to be the biggest thing, consent and healthy relationships. Uh, a lot of people think about sexual education as just about STIs and worried about, oh, well, how do I protect myself? But really what students seem to need and what the community seems to want uh, is a lot more consent-based education and education that encompasses uh, to us LGBTQIA people. That's awesome. And I know that a couple of our episodes, so I think number three of the episodes that we're doing is on healthy relationships and boundaries. And then the one following that is going to be a little bit more nuanced, say, on like kink and fetishism, BDSM, and how that interacts with, say, power and control and relationships, which is going to be awesome. Um, I'm super looking forward to those. I think it's going to be great. Um, I'm wondering before we hop into questions, because I want to take make sure that we get questions from the participants. So if you could think about your questions, that'd be great. But before we jump into that, I'm wondering if Emmy, Denise, Elliot, in whatever order, if you want to touch a little bit on like, how do you think that we can change what's currently happening with sexual, sexual health education? Like, how can we make it more inclusive in schools? Do we talk to our MHAs? Do we talk to the school district? Like, what, what can we do as individuals or as organizations or as groups to improve it? What can we do? Or what do you think? If you don't know, it's okay. I'm just curious if you do. Uh, I'll take a swing at this one. Uh, yeah, and sure. I'm certain because I, I really want to hear uh, what uh, both Emmy and Elliot think of this as well. Um, I know for myself, what I keep noticing is that the health authorities who are very much pushing around sexual health and STBBIs, and that's, that's sort of like the, the uh, where a lot of their heads are at, and then school districts. So I'd like to see ministers. So like the minister of education with the minister of health and to get the right ministers around a table who can say legislatively, we are going to get to work on this. So not a suggestion, not a, an encouragement for what school districts can do. Cause when you leave out that, uh, like when it's not mandatory and uh, some might think I'm heavy handed in saying this needs to be mandatory, but uh, math is mandatory. You know, uh, history and English is mandatory. Sexual health needs to be mandatory and not just sexual health in the here's what your body looks like. 
right now. <laughs> yep. uh, this is what puberty has been told to us is supposed to be about. Like there's so much that needs to kind of be evolved here, but to really look at it uh, as a holistic way and to, while awareness days are great, like I said earlier, this needs to be the entire school year so that people always feel that sense of, of growth and safe space and being very much um, early childhood development. We do not wait to have this conversation when young people are already trying to figure their ways around in this mess <laughs> or, are, or, you know, like, and I say this mess in just the way, cause I, I don't think sexuality is a mess. I don't think gender is a mess. I think the safety that we have in being able to talk openly about it, like we're waiting to a time where it's already like, oh shit, I don't think I'm supposed to talk about this. So I think, um, doing it really early you know i think of i've got nieces and nephews and i remember them being really little and i at the time was uh, was married to a woman and that uh the youngest one said why do we call her and so and so right and the other nephew like the nephew pulls off his sister and has a conversation and then they come back and they said oh and denise you like you're you like women you're a lesbian and it's like yeah and <laughs> But she, and then she says, oh, okay, great. <laughs> and off yeah. she goes, right? So it's, it's really this, this whole idea that, that we need to be afraid to have these conversations. That's got to go. And that's only going to happen when ministers actually make this priority. I mean, I know we have different, uh, you know, the status of women came out and quite some time ago through violence prevention initiative said, we're going to make a full year dedicated to the same way we did the respect women campaign to safe spaces it's never actually materialized and happened. And I think as long as we don't have that, uh, I mean, it's two ways. Top down, it needs to become mandatory. Bottom up grassroots communities need to be allowed in schools, yep. plain and simple. Like it shouldn't be all on the teacher who wasn't taught yep. that in university when they got their education degree, which also needs to change. So in our universities, if you're gonna get an education degree, you need to do a course or something on, I don't know whether it's gender issue. I didn't go to university, so I need somebody else to give me that language. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, right? Like this yeah, needs absolutely. to be entrenched. If you are going to work with young people, guess what? You need to be comfortable with this. And so that we no longer have just a safe and caring school policy, we walk it. We live it. Yes. And it's actual, yeah. it's really happening. But, and I want to hear what others have to say. No, I get long-winded on this one because I'm like, oh, come on. <laughs> no, I think we all super appreciate your lens there. I think that is a very, very valuable input to this conversation. Um, Emmy or Elliot, do you want to comment on it? So the question, if you remember, it's it's how can we how can we address this issue? How can we make sexual health better? Who do we talk to? Where do we go? What do we do? So any thoughts? I think we need to listen to more voices than we're listening to right now. If we let, the, if the only person that makes a decision about what we learn in sexual health is a straight cisgender man and no one else has an input of what we need to learn, then we're probably not including everyone's voices. So like one thing, the grade nine health teacher at my school right now, she is a straight cisgender woman and she came to me and she said, I want to amplify your voice because this is not my story this is your story so when it came to time for her to talk about lgbtq issues she came to me and i went into her class and i was able to talk from a personal experience i was able to give resources and i really think giving more people that voice is super important yeah and we need to take the politics out of it because you can't say that some parents might disagree with lgbtq people yeah. but there are going to be LGBTQ people and they deserve the right to learn about who they are and what they are and what they like just as much as anyone else. Super well said. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Elliot, do you have any thoughts? Sure. Yeah. I absolutely just want to um, reemphasize what Emmy and what uh, Denise had already said. Again, like it needs to be something, um, like Emmy said, there are already LGBT. I think this is the thing when we talk about sex ed back in the 90s, you know, we said well, we have to teach kids about sex ed because they're having sex anyway. And at this point, we have to talk about 2 LGBT people because they exist in the schools anyway. I mean, yep. the kids are already there. You don't do anything by not talking about it except make them feel ostracized and not welcome. Absolutely. And Denise is quite. Yeah, and Denise is quite right that it can't just be coming from the students, right? It has to be coming top down from our government 
uh, there has to be preparation for the teachers as well, because I do have sympathy for um, the teachers who ask organizations like Planned Parenthood to come in and talk because they don't have the education, they don't have the knowledge, um, but it also shouldn't be up to students to then do that work. I mean, as much as it, I'm so grateful for the GSAs and wonderful leaders like Emmy and people like that who are willing to do the work, but it's an uh, unreasonable burden to put on our young people to ask them to to speak when uh, it really needs to be coming from teachers so that we have that buy-in, uh, not just from the, the adults there, but then also to see that people who are in charge are supportive of this. And I think uh, if the status of women can actually, you know, create that safer space campaign and show that it's a priority in our community, um, those top level things might feel a bit far away. But when we see that buy-in from the top level, I think it really helps uh, people understand and then the people who are doing the grassroots community work are allowed into the schools because it seemed to be something that is important and so i think uh yeah just to echo what they both said it's it's so vital uh and then the training needs to be there definitely i'm so, so glad that denise mentioned the whole math like we we are we are taught math and this is like one of the biggest things that i always go back to too is we're, we're taught long division i don't know about anyone else but i've not done long division since school but as a sexually active individual, I have the right to know about my health care. Absolutely. Yep. That's a great point. It's so, so, so true. Um, so I want to ask for questions from the audience now. So I've had a little click through the chat. Uh, I can see one of the questions was, and anybody can answer this, we can, you can just hop in and say, you know what, I can take this one on. Um, so the question here is, any suggestions for trans-related resources or resources for dealing with dysphoria in relation to sex? That's an excellent question. Um, there's actually sort of, well, I'm sure somebody else can tackle this as well, but uh, so as a, I didn't bring this up in my introduction, but I am actually a uh, transgender man. And so that was something that was sorely lacking in my sexual health education, but there are quite a few organizations now who are providing that uh, information. Speaking from a trans masculine perspective, there's a great resource called Primed that uh, has just been reissued. It's something that came out uh, several years ago about what sex can be and look like. But I am actually, this is a, an interesting moment where I realize I don't know a resource for comprehensive transgender sexual health education uh, from any particular Canadian organizations. There is Trans Bodies, Trans Cells, which is a book very much, oh, there we go, Katie, Kurt's on it in the chat. So I'll, I'll give it over and let somebody else uh, sort of speak to that. I have another yeah. question here. Sorry, did you want to say something, Denise? Uh, I was just gonna say, like certainly, and, and I tend to, I turn to, uh, like I said, Katie a lot because they have such good information and it's so user friendly. Uh, but I also, I think that we, like we're, we're slowly, it's happening within uh, not just this province, but it's going out to the rest of the country and the Atlantic region as well, that we're finding our own networks, right? And we're building those networks. So when I think of like what Cod Wrangell has been doing, I think of what Safe Alliance has been doing, what Planned Parenthood has been doing. Like I think sometimes reaching out to these local resources will help you to find someone who helps you know, bridge this with you, you get an advocate with you, you get someone to help guide you through this and to connect you to whether it's peer support or mentorship. Like, I think all of those things are, are existing and we're, we're learning and we're growing together. I mean, this, these episodes, like this series speaks to that where we're being proactive and, and taking our health care and our sexual health and, and we're taking our place, right? And that's uh, somebody had mentioned about decolonizing work. That is the work where we are starting to take up spaces that predominantly we weren't allowed in. And, uh, and we're starting to say, this is what we want things to look like. I, I also, uh, I agree that it, it's, we need to allow young people to be young people and to have those sources to go to. At the same time, like SHIELD thrives on being youth led because young people can tell us way better most times what the resources that they like to see, but also their, them as knowledge holders and the lived experience they already have. Uh, young people have taught me so much about sexual health in the way of understanding more things around the spectrum and to open my mind around uh, what resources they they need me to help them find and and to bring out to the rest of our community right so we do have you know peat like canada is another place that there's trans support nl like there's um i, I think of a good 
have a friend of mine, uh, uh, StellRaven.com, where Stell specifically as a trans indigenous man is offering, like doing online therapy for in particular youth and trans and indigenous queer who are struggling and wanting to have those safe places. So, I mean, we're building our, <laughs> our I don't want to say army because it makes it sound like we need to go to war and I think we're past that. I think we're, we're building our tribe. There you go. I'll, I'll use that language because it's, it's our family, right? So, uh, so yeah, I, I think we could go on and on, but it's seeking out and then let's work together. Yeah. I have one thing to add. Yeah, for sure. Go ahead, give her. So, um, I've never experienced much around gender myself. I've kind of, that's one thing that I haven't really touched on yet in my life. But my partner recently came out as non-binary. And one of the things that's helped them so much in their journey is joining like different social media groups. So they join like Discord servers, Facebook groups, and just finding like-minded people and people that are like them. It's helped them feel so much more comfortable. And the way they talk about it now is so much more comfortable. Like the way they see themselves, I can just see such a difference since they started joining all these groups and being more comfortable. Yeah, like I can actually cry. That's precious. <laughs> um, that's awesome. And you know what? I, I actually want to expand on that a little bit. So I know that there are many, many community organizations here that are doing this work and providing these services. Like Charlie mentioned Planned Parenthood. I know um, the AIDS Committee. I know uh, the Women's Center also provides these services. Thrive does. Like I know that there's many places that are sex positive and that are providing these resources. Um, and I, I think that's wonderful. Um, I just wanted to know from everybody's, everybody's um, point of view if you could in one concise sentence or in one short thing if you could dream up the future of how you would see sexual health education what do you want included or what do you think what do you think the future of it is or what would you want to see I think for me I'd like to see sort of inclusive sex ed where instead of these things being sort of add-ons that they're always already built in uh, transgender people, for example, are not different than cisgender people. Cisgender people have gender too, and they need to think deeply about it. Uh, the type of sex that we as trans folks have or the type of medical care we need is not dramatically different. And so treating it like it's an add-on or a separate thing or something scary or ununderstandable is the wrong approach. Uh, and I also think, uh, to add to that, that consent-based education in all things, not just sex, but in everything. And it can't just be one quarter of the physical health class. It needs to be in all of the classrooms, just to echo what Charlie was saying. Uh, we, we think we need to understand consent and healthy relationships and our own bodies far more than we need to know long division. Absolutely. What about you, Denise or Emmy? Do you have anything to add? It's okay if you don't. I have a different question that I can ask. <laughs> I'm curious. Okay, I, I'll ask this one because I'm curious. I know that just now we talked about finding that community, and I know Emmy, you brought up the the Facebook groups and that sort of thing. And there's there's many organizations, and like Campy Clips even is a great place to find community. Um, why do you think it is so important to have a community around you? Like I know that you know they you said that they literally got on the groups and they're already more comfortable. Like why do you think that is important to see yourself reflected elsewhere? Like Basically, what does representation mean to you is what I'm asking. <laughs> Anybody can answer, it doesn't matter who. Representation to me makes me feel seen and heard. And I think one of the worst feelings in the whole world is feeling alone. In my opinion, I hate feeling alone. I think that is the absolute worst. So any sort of community or group that can make you feel less alone, more heard and more understood, I just think it helps every aspect of your life. I'm so thankful for every group I've been a part of. It's changed me every single one. Sure. Denise or Elliot, do you have anything you want to say to that? Just that I completely wholeheartedly agree. Yep. And I know that for me personally, that when I see myself reflected, so in queer sexual health, like when I see you know, my preferences are reflected in inclusive sexual health. I feel included and I feel part of something that's, you know, that people actually want to talk about, which is why I kind of was part of this project and why I wanted to be here. Because I think, you know, for any folks that are listening and have felt alone or have felt either you don't have information, you know, we're, we're trying to create a space where we can share that, that kind of information and can tackle these conversations. So I think it's super important. Um, and uh, just want to thank you all for being here. I'm going to check and see if there's any more questions. Um, 
two. Um, one is how can policy support sexual uh, health education curriculum development? So that's a lot. Ooh, that's a lot to unpack, yeah. <laughs> but, um, a lot of that starts from what Denise initially said, like getting the ministers to actually have the awkward conversations themselves about what has to be standard in the sense of what we need to know and getting them in the room to agree on it, to say, no, this is, this is it. It's not, you can leave something out if you're uncomfortable or move on to the next topic so that you don't have to, you know, have those awkward conversations. So I just think a part of that is definitely getting the ministers to sit down and discuss, like this is an actual issue that needs to be addressed. Yep, yeah. And I, I think of, and I'll use this as an example. So something that I'm really excited about that's happening in, in Labrador now is that Labrador Grimfall Health, uh, and they have an incredibly uh, open-minded and proactive uh, medical officer of health who has been spearheading uh, getting us together as stakeholders and as governments and indigenous governments. And uh, we've just initially, so we've had our first meeting and it's the sexual health and harm reduction um, regional committee. There you go. Uh, a little bit of a mouthful, but basically the idea is that uh, he, he wants sexual health to be intertwined in everything that gets done in, in our region and not just in healthcare, like that's why pulling together all of these other entities so that we're all kind of working and on the same page. And a big thing for me that I'm excited about, and this is something that, that Charlie has gotten very involved in as well with us, is looking at how we, um, we go right from when somebody walks in through a hospital or clinic door and that every staff person, every point of contact becomes inclusive, is informed. It is not like optional to make sure that you, you know, you know what you're doing. It's not the, the whole, you know, pardon my language, but the bullshit around, am I being politically correct and how sometimes agencies can throw that back at us. And, and it's like, it's tongue in cheek, right? But that they want everything so that we're being completely inclusive and, and what we've said or like shield. I mean, we're one project that's funded, of course, like everybody else for, you know, a couple of years or three years or so wanting us to do that kind of work. We've said, like, we can put together a training to help you understand gender and sexuality and the inclusion that needs to happen but what you need is systemic policy change that goes right through every system so it's not about you can attend this webinar if you got time no it's part of your professional development training and you do not have the option on this and if you don't come along like the same way there was a time you know, i was talking to my mom about this the other day we were talking about just how things have been like there was a time when her to put on a seatbelt sounded ridiculous. Like, why would we ever put on a seatbelt? They didn't put on seatbelts. And somebody said, now I have to do this all the time. But yet now here we are, we put it, we automatically get aboard the vehicle, we put on our seatbelt. Harm reduction and being able to just learn together. So I think that unless it is in policy, unfortunately, we are going to have individuals who will say, well, you know, it's another part of my contract. I don't really have to do it. We, know, we can't make this stuff optional because lives depend on it. And I think we need to be very clear. So when ministers get to a table, it's not ministers by themselves. They need people with lived experience. They need to have youth. They need to have people who are living and breathing. And this is because what I do is part of my work, but it's, this is my life. You know, like if I'm not in a place where I can be safe, I, it actually is a threat to my life as an indigenous two spirit individual my life is at risk every day until these fucking, pardon my life, <laughs> till these <laughs> systems, yeah, sorry, oh, until these systems yeah. change, right? So this is how we have to look at it. This is not, these are people's lives. And so we need to take it seriously. So the same way that we want to address any of these issues that we know have huge lifelong impacts, because right now we can't answer the question, are the high suicide rates that we see in per certain parts of our province, are they, are they connected to gender and sexuality? We don't know that. Nobody is asking those questions. And as long as we're not asking those questions, that's a problem. Like we need to really not be afraid to rip things wide open because like we talked about truth and reconciliation, you cannot reconcile, you cannot heal until you know the truth. And sometimes the truth is gonna hurt but then we can, we can work from there, you know, we can heal from there. Sorry, I don't mean to keep going on and on, but. No, that's great. 
And I, I think I want to jump on that a little bit and just say that harm reduction to me is just providing resources and information. So if you're unaware of that language, what it is, is you're, it's, you know, we have the program here in the city, the SWAP program, uh, Safe Works as Safe works access program where they provide and take in clean needle supplies for folks who use drugs and what it does it actually provides the opportunity to have safe supplies so that you're you're reducing the risk of them uh you know contracting uh, diseases or stbis or any of those things so i think in this case harm reduction for this series is providing a platform for this these conversations and this information because without this people are being harmed and people are suffering and like you said their lives are at risk denise and I think part of harm reduction is is providing this opportunity. So I want to thank you all for speaking um, so much. I, I thank you all so much for your expertise. Uh, I would say this would be a good place to close it here for the day. Charlie, I don't know what you're thinking, but. Oh, um, I just want to add to the, the fact of talking about harm reduction, like it's giving people the choice to make their decisions based off informed information. Right, yeah. like that, that is the point. So if someone is being given actual sexual health, and it being inclusive and it being fully fleshed out education, that person is making the decision based on the knowledge that they're given. So I'm, I'm 35, 36, I can't remember my age, that's how tired I am. Um, <laughs> but the fact when I was in high school and, you, and uh, junior high, it was scare tactics. It was literally show you the worst possible scenarios and fear you into never, into, to, into celibacy basically don't touch anyone or you'll get this. Don't do that or you'll get this. Um, so that had a reverse effect where it's like it automatically starts making you not wanting to have those relationships or building any kind of connection with anyone in an intimate way because you're terrified of the situation of what could happen. And that was based off the information I was given. That was based off the education I was provided. So mm -hmm. I wasn't given the full story. I was given the narrative that someone wanted me to take in and deal with. And that's how I dealt with it. Versus being told, you know, these are worst case scenarios. There are, there are condoms, there's PEP, there's PrEP, like all of these, like there are clinics, dental there are, <laughs> there's dental dams. Some of, <laughs> some of these uh, things are curable. Like, you know, the concept of that was very not there. It was scare you into submission so that you take that kind of education and walk away and carry it, yep. which is, it's harmful. Like it's, it's downright harmful. Absolutely. I uh, just want to let everybody know there is a, a post-event survey if you want to fill it out. Kirk did put the link in the chat. So if you have a little look there, you want to pop us and tell us what you thought, what you thought about it. Um, be as honest as you want. We'd love to hear your feedback. Um, yeah. That's it. Yes, thanks everybody. Uh, I hope you all have a lovely evening. Our next one will be in three weeks time. Um, it's going to be on... Remind me again, Charlie, I can't remember what the second uh, is. Sexual identities. So oh, basically, sorry, gender and identities. Yeah. Yes, so the exactly. first two are more the, the warmer uppers. And then we're going to dive deep into things like kink, um, uh, representation in media like porn or sex work. Um, all of those kind of things are going to be later down the road. We just want to get everyone to get their, get your foot wet and then jump to the deep end with us. Yeah, so three weeks from now, Saturday night, same time, same place. Um, join us. We hope to have you there. Bye. Have a good night, everybody.